Grace, mercy, and peace be richly abounding to you from God, our loving Father, and Jesus, our living Redeemer and Savior, who spoke these words in the Gospel. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. These are words of our Lord. Dear friends and our Lord Jesus, our world's only Savior, it's Father's Day. So dads who are present, happy Father's Day. God's richest blessings to you. And for those of us whose fathers aren't present, well, God give us a rich remembrance and a spirit of thanksgiving for the dads he gave us. And if if you're one to whom there's a lack or a gap, there for not having a good father image. Thank God for the good images of fatherhood that have come through others. Rich blessings all. You know, our gospel reading happens to give us a picture of the knowledge and care your heavenly father has for you, for he, he is the true pattern, an example for earthly fathers to imitate. Maybe like me, you've sometimes gotten a piece of communication that wants you to acknowledge that you've received it, and so you either email back or you text back, click, and say, got it. That's that word acknowledge. Sometimes my wife tells me things and I look like I'm not paying a whole lot of attention to them. So to let her know that, I usually say, yes, dear, or I got that. I acknowledge it. We've got a problem with words here because Jesus talks about using the same word. Neither of these words, these uses of the word acknowledge that I've given so far even come close to what Jesus means when he says, whoever acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge. It's not like Jesus saying, oh, yeah, yeah, I know, I know that one. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, whoop. Oh, yeah, Father, that one too. I know that one. No, 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 that's not it. And it's not just about, oh, oh yeah, I know about Jesus. Yeah, I acknowledge it. Now, let's dig deeper. None of these match that. In fact, the word the ESV translators use for acknowledge most often is translated confess. It means to say the same thing as, and it usually means to do so with ardency, urgency. And so I thought I would prove my point, and I went to the shelf behind where I sit in my office, and I quick grabbed every different translation of Bible known to me that I have, and I figured I'd prove my point. I started looking through them. This didn't take hours. It took like just minutes. And really, and what I found was that four, tra- four translations used acknowledge, five used the word confess, and one, one used the word own. Oh, that one was interesting. So Jesus said in that translation, Whoever owns me before men, I will also own before my Father in heaven. That speaks to us. That's interesting. Because that's what Jesus really means. So Jesus is talking about living our lives before men in such a way as to give clear witness that we belong to him and that thereby we seek to live and speak and do as those redeemed by him. That ought to be easy, right? Something in us tells us it's not as easy as that. It should be easy though, right? I mean, think of all that Christ has done for us. He came, he laid aside his heavenly glory and came to be born among us. I've been present at the birth of a few children and it's kind of a messy procedure. And the baby doesn't come out all clean and swaddled and wrapped in nice, clean clothes either. Uh, That happens after some cleanup work is done. And I'm reminded that Jesus, the Son of God, stooped to be born of Mary. He wasn't just 
dropped into her arms. He came to embrace all that it is to be human for us. For what? To be fully obedient to his Father's will and as one who is truly righteous and guiltless to bear our sins in his body and take it to the cross and atone for it. That's what he's done for us. It should be easy to witness to one who showed such love, right? How come it isn't? How come it isn't? He's the one who says, so everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. And as Jesus died and as he rose, his resurrection demonstrates our future and the future of our humanity. Resurrection, eternal life. Should be easy to confess him. So what's our goal this morning as we look at this passage? Sometimes pastors beat around the bush and you never know what the real goal is. I'll tell you today. Let the hearer be challenged to confess or acknowledge or to own whatever the word is that you like best. To confess, acknowledge, or own Christ boldly and faithfully in all aspects of our lives. That's my prayer for goal. May God the Holy Spirit bless it. You see, confessing, acknowledging, owning Christ ought to be easy after all he's done for us. But it isn't. That's because it's a matter of spiritual warfare. It's a matter of spiritual warfare because Satan, the archenemy, the enemy of God, and of you and of your soul and your very life, he seeks to silence the message of Christ. He seeks to snuff out the light of Christ. And most often, Satan uses the fear of man to do that, in our lives and in our confessing. The fear of man, fear of what others may say, fear of what others may do if they resent or take offense at our confessing of Christ. Jesus warned us people would take offense at us. People would revile us and persecute us, but he promised us great blessing in the so doing. After the book of Psalms in the Old Testament is the book of Proverbs, those puzzling sayings. And in chapter 29, you find this verse that says, The fear of man brings a snare. What is a snare? Don't think snare drum. Snare as in a trap, a self-springing trap that was used to catch birds back in Bible times. And so the bird would be maybe pecking on some kernels of wheat that they had and trip some little piece of string or twine, and zoop, the bird is caught. So I'm going to picture the snare like this. The snare. The fear of man brings a snare, says the word of God. Well, let's explore this a little bit. The time comes for us to stand up for Jesus, and ooh, we kind of shrink and we're not very vocal. Why? Why? Fear of man. (laughs) Yep. I confess that it's affected me throughout my life. I'm reminded how when I went to Lutheran school, I had to take the city bus home, and so I was like the only kid on the city bus. And sometimes someone else would say, hey, kid, what are you doing on this bus? And I could say, well... I go to this Lutheran school, you see, and and I look now and say, whoa, man, I could have used that as a dandy witnessing opportunity to say, and what do you think of Jesus? But all I wanted was just to be my private person. And I didn't use it as an opportunity for that. I was sort of ashamed of just going to a Lutheran school. After all, nobody else was subjected to the humility of riding the city bus home. Yeah, fear of man. Fear of man. Fear of being misunderstood. So you just shut up. Is that what God wants of his children? I don't think so. The message that Christ is the true and only Son of God, Israel's Messiah, and the light for the Gentiles, and the only ransom for sinners, 
is the message God wants us to confess. This is what we are to believe and to say about Jesus, the very same thing that God says, ergo the word confess. But it's a message that rebellious hearts ridicule. Make no mistake about it. Shall we confess this truth and this Lord and this Savior plainly and faithfully? Or do we think about what our fellow man might say and taking this into account, turn the volume down on our witness up? Fear of man. Yeah. The work of Christ is encapsulated in the creeds that we confess. They're a pretty good witnessing tool, actually. And we can use them in our daily devotions. We can use them in family devotions. Christ says that the person who confesses him before others, he will say that he owns that person before the Father in heaven. This one's mine, Father. Bring him in. Yet we are salted by a fear of derision or scorn. Call it what it is, fear of man, and it brings that snare. And the voice of our confession is drowned out, grows quieter. Such silence can even erode faith and lead us into unbelief so that faith withers and dies. And in the face of fear of man, what's likely to happen? Simply put, we're likely to deny Jesus. It's that easy. The only other place Matthew uses this word deny, by the way, is at the end of chapter 26. Peter and his denying of Jesus. And I take away two lessons from that. One, the grave matter of sin that it is to deny Jesus. But then I also take in the glorious grace of our Lord Jesus Christ who forgave Peter, who restored Peter, who gave him additional opportunities to speak his name boldly when no one else was going to probably do that. And even the, even the privilege of dying a martyr's death for Jesus, he gave to Peter. And the early church witness of Peter is that when it came time for him to be crucified, he begged for them to do it to him upside down so that because he wasn't worthy to die in the manner his Lord died. And the witness of the early church also is that he preached in that manner until he died from the cross. But unless checked with repentance and renewed faith,
the thought did go through me while I was eating lunch before I went to get that car. Was um, what if someone's offended by your witness? Oh, yeah. Oh, maybe I must. Have no, no, no. That's not how we think. Guaranteed, they will be far more offended if they spend eternity in hell than if I say nothing about Jesus. Far more offended. And all these thoughts took me to a hymn that we used to have in our hymn book until we got with our service book. It was number 346. It went like this. Jesus said, shall it ever be a mortal man ashamed of thee? Ashamed of thee, the angels praise, whose glory shine through endless days. Then I skip on down to verse 4. Ashamed of Jesus, that dear friend on whom my hopes of heaven depend? No, when I blush, be this my shame, that I no more revere his name. Ashamed of Jesus? Well, yeah, I may, when I have no guilt to wash away, no tear to wipe, no good to crave. No fear to quell, no soul to save. Till then, nor is my boasting vain, till then I boast a Savior slain. And oh, may this my glory be that Christ is not ashamed of me. Well, confessing Christ is not just about words, though, although it is about words. It's also about deeds. Do our deeds align with the words that we spew? Is my witness, for example, at home clear and consistent? If not, guess what? Repentance is in order. And perhaps asking forgiveness of those I've offended. Is my confession of Christ clear by my words and my deeds in the workplace and in my daily life? If not, no, you know what? Repentance is in order. And by the way, as we consider the current scene across our nation with tensions as they are, confessing Christ in the current scene of the racial tensions must certainly testify to the truth of God's word. And what is that? We are all descended from one man, from Adam. There are not many races. There is one human race with various characteristics largely because of geographic isolation over centuries of time. We're descended from one man, so the black man is your brother, as is the Asian, as is the Native American, as is the South American. Have I an interest in treating all human beings as equals in God's sight? That needs to be part of our confession. For God has made his will clear. He has shown you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. So, nothing less than confessing Christ faithfully will do. And where we've fallen short in this regard and sinned in thought, in word, in deed, Yep, you got it. No better time than now to repent and show the Savior's love the way he intends it to be shown. For many, the cost of confessing their Lord has been high. You saw the high cost Jeremiah paid, public ridicule. On another occasion, he was thrown into an empty cistern that just had mud in the bottom and he sunk up to his knees. What a mess. For us, it might be that high or higher. In the early church, those who confessed, those who bore witness at the very cost of their lives, you see the Greek word to bear witness is martyreo. They were called martyrs, those who were killed for their witness of Jesus. And it happens today, too. Not just in China. In Nigeria this past week, there was an ambush of a village and over 40 were killed, including a four-year-old by Muslim tribesmen. It happens. It happens for confessing Christ. Some through the ages have defected, wishing to save their own skins. Bad choice. Make no mistake about it, though, except for the power of the Holy Spirit working in you and in me, 
we too would all take the easier route, the fleshly route, the rational route, the save our skins route, the tone it down route because of the fear of man. Oh, but you know what that brings. But as we see those who have confessed Christ and been faithful, maybe ones we know of or ones we know personally, as we see them, we're encouraged by their example and their witness. We've got a hymn that speaks of some of those, and since you got your hymn notes in front of you, pull it out and look at number 661. 661, the Son of God goes forth to war. Great hymn. Oh my, is it a great hymn. Authored by the same guy who gave us holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty. And in verse 1, it talks about Jesus. The Son of God goes forth to war, a kingly crown to gain. His blood-red banner streams afar. Who follows in his train? Who best can drink his cup of woe, triumphant over pain? Who patient bears his cross below? He follows in his train. More on that next week, by the way, with the passage that comes in the gospel about counting the cost and bearing it. Verse 2, the martyr first. Who was the first martyr? Bible quiz. It was Stephen. Stephen, who testified and it wasn't received very well in the temple. The martyr first, whose eagle eye could pierce beyond the grave, who saw his master in the sky and called on him to save, like him, with pardon on his tongue, in midst of mortal pain, he prayed for them who did the wrong. Who follows in his train? Who does like him? Verse 3 now talks about the twelve whom Jesus was instructing in our gospel reading. A glorious band, the chosen few on whom the Spirit came. Twelve valiant saints, their hope they knew and mocked the cross and flame. They met the tyrant's brandished steel, the lion's gory mane. They bowed their necks the death to feel. Who follows in their train? Who's like them? Finally, verse 4 brings us up through the ages. A noble army, men and boys, the matron and the maid, around the Savior's throne rejoice in robes of light arrayed. They climbed the steep ascent of heaven through peril, toil, and pain. O oh God, to us may grace be given to follow in their train, to do like they did. Someone has likened the Christian faith to a popular game show on TV. You'll know which one I'm talking about. Because what does it involve? It involves giving up everything here for what lies beyond the curtain. Well, you're going to hold on to this, or do you want what's behind the curtain? And what are the things God's provided and promised behind the curtain? Forgiveness of sins, peace with God, reconciliation, recon resurrection to eternal life, a glorious reunion with all the beloved departed. You want what's behind the curtain? It's not a foolish trade. It's not foolhardy. We're assured of the outcome if we only trust this word, which, by the way, in verse 2 of the opening hymn we prayed, Lord, give to your word impressive power. Make it convincing to us too. Sixty years ago, missionary Jim Elliott wrote in his diary, He is no fool who gives, what he can, gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And then he yielded his life as a missionary to the Aka Indians and was promptly killed with another couple of his compadres by their headhunters. I'm reminded of this because in the last month this was in the news because one of those headhunters died at the advanced age of 89 or 90 or something. They didn't have birth certificates. And his story was brought back. And he was thankful even though he had joined in helping kill Jim Elliot, He was thankful for the message of Jesus that he brought to him. Jesus said, So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Christian, when that moment of eternity comes and the curtain opens up and Christ owns you before his Father, into the eternal heavenly life and the bliss and glory of that place, you and I will say without hesitation, it was worth it. 
this confessing of Christ. Now may God's rich peace guard and preserve your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.